gentleman to my right, Seth Gilliam. Um, look, we're going to talk about his career. We're going to leave plenty of time for questions and answers. Um, there are going to be some minor spoilers. Look, folks, obviously we're going to be talking about The Walking Dead. And if you haven't caught up, all right, how do you conduct your life? Catch up. You're a Walking Dead fan. Come on. All right, so also we're going to be talking about zombies, probably some space bugs, and some crazy Dutch directors. So, you know, there could be some language whenever Paul Verhoeven is involved. But if you don't mind, I'm going to give you a, give you a little introduction. Okay. Fantastic. Okay. Let's see, let's see if Seth runs out of here. In his nearly 25 or over 25 year career as a stage, television, and film actor, Seth has worked with writers and directors like David Simon, Edward Zwick, and Paul Verhoeven. He's managed to hold his own against heavyweights like Denzel Washington, Meg Ryan, Matt Damon, Andrew Lincoln, Jeffrey Dean Morgan, and some of my personal favorites, Lance Reddick, Chad Coleman, yeah. Kevin Brown from 30 Rock. Yeah. Anyway, um, and of course, the manliest man of all time, Michael Ironsides, anybody? All right. So Seth has been drenched in goo and gore by some of the best in the business, but still, as a character actor, in films of Courage Under Fire, Jefferson in Paris, Starship Troopers, and Still Alice, and of course, television shows like Oz, The Wire, Nurse Jackie, Teen Wolf, Criminal Minds, uh, three out of the five law and workers, I counted. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and, and of course, a little show called The Walking Dead. Anybody? He has consistently elevated his material and delivered every time. Please welcome Seth Gilliam. Welcome to Salt Lake. Welcome to Fan X. Thank you. Now, look, let's just get this out of the way. All right, Avengers Fever is running wild. Spider-Man uh, is my favorite superhero, and it was, uh, it's mostly because of his sense of humor. Yeah. Um, uh, and, uh, yeah, it's the sarcasm, it's the sense of humor, it's that uh, he adapts, he usually loses the first fight, at least this was my Marvel comic experience, really, yeah. growing up. He would lose the first battle and make some kind of adjustment and come back and win, you know, Spider-Man. So you read comics? I did. Now, I know you're not necessarily a horror guy. I'm not. <laughs> Sci-fi, though? Sci-fi, baby. Westerns? Eh. Eh, no, darn it. We're going to be talking about that a little bit later, because uh, I swear you're doing a little pill writer in The Walking Dead. I think so. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I like pill writing. Yeah, good stuff. Well, let's talk about your origin story, if we can. Okay. So, uh, you went to, you went to, grew up in New York? Yes, born and raised. That's where was it? Why? Why is it? Uh, because I live in Salt Lake and I don't go anywhere. So. Oh, okay. I'm from uh, I'm from Washington Heights, which is like the northwestern tip of Manhattan, uh, from a place called Dyken Dyken Projects. Um, so uh, it's an inner city housing project. They have like 14 buildings, 14 stories each, about. 12 apartments per floor. You wanted to know. So. I did want to know. And you answered me. And thank you for answering me. Because honestly, it gives me a little insight sometimes into some of your performances and the way you handle some of your material. Okay. Uh, you know. And I was raising the projects in New York City? No, not necessarily. Okay. <laughs> Am I digging a little here? Sorry. No, no, not at all. No, no I, seriously, I mean, look, it's pretty clear from your style of acting from your method that you you studied theater. Is that true? I did, yes. I went to a theater training program. I went to the high school of performing arts and then I went to uh, SUNY Purchase, which is a has a theater training program. Were there any uh, <laughs> were there any uh, specific courses on playing doctors, lawyers, priests, cops, <laughs> soldiers? No, no, there weren't. There weren't. There was there was just working on moment to moment reality mostly. Well it's, it's interesting because I mean the world of professional acting is, um, I mean, it's extremely volatile. It's mm -hmm. financially potentially very dangerous. Like, what, what art or experience really pushed you to take that leap and to, to pursue acting on a professional level? I don't have any other skills or talents. It's <laughs> <laughs> pretty much it. It's like, this is what you got, kid. Make the best of it. <laughs> um, I uh, I don't know I I, I came up uh, in a time when 
uh, I didn't really have those concerns. You know, I, 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 I'm not a large man, I don't eat much. I don't need much uh, to survive, so I, you know, I, I guess maybe I overly romanticized the whole starving artist thing when I was younger and it carried me through. Um, uh, I mean, there were times I, uh, you know, I lived in Los Angeles for a while and ended up sleeping in my car for the last month that I was there and I thought, well, that's not going so well. So I went back to New York, but that was, um, that was really, uh, it, it, was a, it was a necessary experience to have. So um, it didn't seem to me like very dangerous or volatile at the time. You know, it just was. It just, it just was. I mean, I had a lot of friends. You know, I showered and bathed. It wasn't like I was you know, in the car just like, so I'm Funk Master Flex for the next one. Well, so what was your, I mean, you living in your car, right? Yeah. What was your big break, would you say? What was the one that got you through? Um, yeah, pretty, uh, your IMDb page is ridiculous. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I don't know. Uh, I, I don't know. I, I was in theater in New York to um, uh, to do plays with to keep myself, you know, uh, active and in the minds and eyes of the casting people. Uh, you know, so I got bits here and there, so I never really felt like there was any one thing that was like, oh, this is now my big break, my big chance. Because uh, a lot of the stuff that I do is ensemble stuff, so it's not like, oh, you know, Seth Gilliam is. It's like, no, and Seth Gilliam has, is more like the, the casting breakdown for me. Do you feel more comfortable as an actor in an ensemble? Or do you prefer leads? I don't know, they're, uh, they're, they're, it's, it's a different beast. Uh, I, I like to play, so there's, there seems to be more playing in an ensemble. Um, the, the lead is responsible for uh, so many different things, and oftentimes it's just not as, as interesting a character. Yeah. yeah, well also sounds like you can have a little more fun in the ensemble rather than carrying on the weight. Yeah, but uh, you know you've got a lot of weight to carry in the ensemble because if you drop, you know, the ball and things fall apart, you can't, you can't set the lead up to be heroic or to be tragic or to be whatever it, 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 he's or she is called upon to be. Well, you uh, speaking of ensembles, um, you uh, you got you did a three episode arc in a little show called I think it was called the Cosby Show. Around <laughs> <laughs> ninety. Yeah. Yeah. Look, some things have happened, but I'm more interested. What was it like to get that first network paycheck? <laughs> oh, the first network paycheck. That had to be great. Um, yeah, that was, uh, I'm trying to remember what it was, how much it was worth. Uh, it was more zeros than I'd seen before, so that was pretty exciting. Um, I think I went out and I bought myself a leather motorcycle jacket, a lime green, Cox Portif <laughs> jumpsuit <Yep. laughs> and white Rockport sneakers. <laughs> because, you know, it was the 80s. <laughs> <laughs> that was fantastic. I am kind of curious, though, I mean, me finally you know, breaking into a, a network show, I mean, arguably, you know, at, at its height, I mean, what did you take away from that as a, as a young actor? It was the number one show on television at the yeah. time, and it was battling with The Simpsons for uh, supremacy in that slot. Um, and I had gotten that job um, a month or so out of graduating from Purchase. Um, but I had just done Shakespeare in the Park with Denzel Washington, who did Richard III. A week and a half after I graduated, I was Prince Edward of Wales. So, um, and he had just won the Oscar. Uh, and for glory, for glory yeah. at that point. Um, like the day before our first rehearsal, he had just won the Oscar. Um, so I had, had, I had had an experience with kind of suddenly a lot of people are watching you thing from that. So being on the Cosby Show immediately after that, it, uh, uh, it was different, you know, in television, you're, you're just kind of shooting for the people on the crew. 
and you don't really have a sense of the scope of it until it airs. There's no feedback. Right? There's no feedback yeah. right away. So, um, so it didn't really, it didn't really uh, weigh on me that oh, I was on the number one show, you know, in the world, in all that of school. Well, so that's an interesting segue, and it kind of bridges a, a gap for me because one of the next big breaks you have, I mean, you definitely had some television and film work in between, including Jefferson and Paris with Nick Nolte. But you were on a little film called Courage Under Fire, directed by Edward Sitch. Wait, can anybody see this? 1996, phenomenal film. You have seven billing with uh, Denzel Washington, Meg Ryan, Lou Diamond Phillips, who was awesome in that movie. Yeah, he was fantastic. And Matt Damon, yeah. who looks 12 years old. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> So you play Sergeant uh, Altmeyer, you're in a small, you're in a small group, helicopter goes down. The movie is basically Rashomon meets uh, the first Gulf War. Yeah. Yeah. And how did you get involved with this? It sounds like you may have actually known Denzel, who knew Edward Zwick. Was there or did you just audition? Call? I auditioned on a Saturday afternoon in some high-rise apartment building on the east side of New York, which was unheard of at the time, and I was like, what am I going to exactly? <laughs> I, I was auditioning, <laughs> auditioning on a Saturday, first of all, and why does it have to be in your apartment? <laughs> Pizza boy situation. I'm not sure. War movies. <laughs> so um, I went, and uh, it was it was uh, it was really cool because I went and I had prepared for this one particular character, and I read for Ed Zwick, and he said, "Oh, can you do you mind reading this other character?" And, uh, I had, um, I had, you know, I was very cocky at the time. I was like, sure, you know, give me a minute. And he's like, can you know, take your time. I was like, no, give me a minute. So I took a minute and then I looked at the thing and the guy had to cry. And I was like, oh, what the fuck? <laughs> so I made myself cry in, uh, in under a minute. And uh, he was like, oh, that was beautiful, that was beautiful. I was like, big, 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 big. Wow. And then I left, and um, I got a call about an hour and a half later that they wanted to uh, cast me in, in the role. Wow, an hour and a half. I mean, that, that movie has some gnarly action in it. I mean, did you ever done anything with that level of action? No, I hadn't, and we trained with like the Austin SWAT team, because um, uh, we, we, uh, we shot in Austin, Texas, and um, we, uh, we trained with uh, some other paramilitary guys, and we had to do the whole obstacle course and you go through right-handed and then you come back left-handed, you know, with live fire and yeah, it was really, really exciting and um, it was something I had never done before, as I mentioned before, I grew up in the projects and, you know, I grew up in the 70s, it wasn't like the projects of today where people are shooting people left and right, then, you know, you beat people with sticks. <laughs> You know, I don't know why I'm laughing at that. I was like, I know, it was the 70s. Everybody was tough to yeah. throw, you know. Maybe you had a knife, it was dull. So, uh, so I was really excited to, uh, to, to work with those people. That's, uh, I mean, that's amazing. In fact, I think it was the scene you're talking about. So there's a scene where Denzel Washington is questioning your character. And at that point, you are emotionally and physically shattered. You're basically trying to increase your medication while he's trying to interrogate you and get the facts straight. Yes. I mean, it's a scene that you have to play as much as much with your eyes as anything. And by the way, I don't know if you know this, you tend to do that in pretty much all of your characters. It's amazing, your, your eye work. I mean, how did you work that out with, with Ed Zwick and with Denzel Washington? Do you, do you remember actually filming that scene? Yeah, and how I you worked that out? I don't, I don't, uh, I don't know you were... You, you, uh, the eyes things. Uh, it's a little creepy. Hey! I'm talking to Father Gabriel. Don't cast stones, alright? <laughs> Don't cast the first stone. Don't do it. Um, no, I. It's a know, they, 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 they move the camera in as tight on your face as it gets, and you just try to go as far uh, internally as, as you can you can go to block out, um, you know, this massive metal contraption inches from your face. Um, but there's no, uh, there wasn't any kind of uh, a specific thing that, that Ed Zwick or, or Denzel did to help me with it. Uh, you know, Denzel is very much a, a, a method actor and he was more concerned with me getting the line out. Uh, Interesting. Well, I, it's, a, it's a powerful scene. Thank you. It's fantastic. I mean, you know, 
You're welcome. <laughs> Pretty good at what you do. So. Well, let's talk about something a little lighter, except that it's in a lot of ways a lot more violent. Okay. Sergeant Sugar Watkins. Starship Troopers? Come on, anybody. But that movie is absolutely bonkers. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so I wanted to just know, because it seems like it started, was that the first time you ever had worked with that much goop and gore? You've got this green blood scene. Yeah, yeah. And you get really killed good. magnificently. Yeah, that was, you know, I, I kind of set myself up for <laughs> going with that one because um, the props department, the guys who were working with it, the machine that was pumping the green goo at me, and uh, it was it was early in the morning. This was in the badlands of, of South Dakota, uh, and it was already about 103 degrees, and maybe 7:30 in the morning. Hey, you were so in those big rubber. Yeah, we were in those rubber costumes, which were which were form fitted so that we all looked muscular, but they also kind of you know stuck to you, and. Um, you know, when I was talking to guys, I was like, that's what you have for me? That's all the goo you have? That's all the blood? This is, you, know, you got this big ass bone. I'm shooting it all in the guts. And that's all you have for me? And they were like, oh. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you totally it. Yes. Rolling. <laughs> that's amazing. Action. My eyes, they're just hosing me down with it. And I'm going, yeah, yeah, you funky sucking suck. <laughs> and that was the tape that they used, and I was like, right, I'm going to go easy. So it's a very, a very, um, a very reverential around props departments now. <laughs> I learned from the lesson, man. I like, keep talking, boy. Well, okay, for a movie that is a hyper violent, anti fascist sci fi satire, mm -hmm. everyone in that cast seems to be having a time of their lives. Yes, we were all young and, you know, we didn't know any better. <laughs> that's, that, that's usually how it works. What kind of training do they provide you? Or was it mostly we trained with, with, uh, uh, with Captain Dale Dye in the, uh, in, yeah, in the, uh, in the Colorado Rockies. Yeah. Um, and we had to go out on. Overnight hike things where we had to dig trenches and put up tents and eat MREs. And Captain Dye would walk around yelling at you and cursing you. And it was cold and snowy. And at one point, like, well, once of us just went back to the hotel and we're like, well, I don't, you know, <laughs> actors, man. But, <laughs> not like we're really at war with giant bombs, <laughs> Captain Dye. <laughs> Crazy man. <laughs> he was he was mad man. He um, most of it perhaps it's why we look like we have such glee when we're firing the weapons, because most of the time it was Paul about fifteen feet beyond the uh, the burst of the uh, of, of the automatic weapons with his plexiglass face they on, pretending to be the bugs. And um, there would be one guy on the far end of the frame with a ten foot pole, tall pole with a with a green tennis ball on top of it, and another guy on the other end, and that was the edge of the frames, and that was how high the bugs were. And then Paul would go, okay, we're ready, and they're rolling, and now the fucking bugs are coming, and they're crazy, and they're crazy, and they're coming for your fucking throat, you fucking crazy fucker! <laughs> and he would run back and forth, and would just be fighting him up. <laughs> so, um, you do have the biggest gun in the show, by the way. I do have the yeah, biggest well, gun. It's, it's the scope. It's the scope yeah, that we yeah. use. It was a specialized scope that um, we got from the military that could see like 1,500 yards or something like that. And, and uh, yeah, it was ridiculous. Did they fire blanks? Pounds. Yeah, they fired blanks and they were specially modified to, um, to switch over from automatic uh, rifle fire to semi-automatic rifle fire or to the shotgun. Yeah. Which Casper also loved. And Jake Busey was also big. He made us uh, potato guns, and we went out onto the uh, into the marshes and badlands and shot potato guns off the sides of the mountains. And it was a lot of fun. <laughs> it's fantastic, actually. It's really cool. Um, Michael Ironside. Yeah. See, as tough as he seems. Yeah. Okay, that's all we need to know. Yeah. Do not want to mess with him. So. 
you go from, uh, I mean, it's just a bombastic, violent, bizarre film. I don't know. Everybody, Starship Troopers, I, look, I don't know what to say about it. And suddenly you switch gears. Now, again, you had, you had some good work in between. To a uh, TV series, which I, and I know I'm going to sound creepy, so just forgive me. I'm a little reverential towards The Wire. Anybody seen this movie or TV show on HBO? Uh, that is the heaviest show I think I've ever seen, and possibly the most rewarding experience I've had in the last decade. I'm not mm -hmm. joking. It's solid stuff. I, I would like to know. I mean, how did you approach the role of Ellis Carver? How did you get involved with The Wire? Did you get a cold audition? Um. Yeah, I had. Uh... I had done a show called Oz on HBO before that, yeah, okay. and uh, it was the same casting director, Alexa Fogel, who oh, cast sure. um, Oz and, and The Wire for HBO, so they called me in for the role of Stringer Bell, actually, for those really? of you who've seen The Wire, yeah, that was my audition for Stringer Bell, and then um, uh, uh, Clark Johnson, who directed the pilot, uh, gave me the, another one of those, here, can you read this other role? The, it's like, thanks, could you, that sucked, but I like you, <laughs> I like you, so could you read this other one? So, uh, you know, so that kind of spurred me on, because I was like, oh, that sucked, you know, F you. <laughs> that sucked. And that became Ellis Carver, was that kind of cop? Well, yeah, it was interesting, because Ellis Carver, I mean, you and her kind of start off as, uh, yeah, I just use this knucklehead. Yeah, knucklehead. You guys are the comic relief. Yeah. But your story arc takes a very different turn. Um, they take your character very seriously. Yeah. Uh, I mean, by season four, I mean, there's you, there's some heartbreaking scenes in that. Of course, by season five. I mean, were you happy with the arc of the character? I I loved it. I it's uh, it, it remains one of my my favorite working experiences ever. I, uh, it's still. I often refer to it as the best show in the history of American television. Yeah, yeah and, no, no, and, um, it's not a joke. I think, uh, I think yeah. it was a special time for me, um, and uh, I, I, I look back on it with, uh, with, with fondness. Do you feel like it kind of spoiled you for other things? <laughs> No, because nobody was watching the show, man. Oh. You know, we were doing the show, and yeah. we would have like a million viewers a week. Uh, our, our biggest, not, uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> our biggest audience was the nine million viewers who tuned in, you know, the, the day one of the major characters was killed off. You know. I, I know you've had some, I've read you've had some pretty strong words about the fact that it was only nominated. Nominated? for two Emmys. Didn't win anything for five years. Why, why do you feel like it was overlooked? Was it just audience size? Was it the content? I think it was, uh, I don't know, may have been a little before its time, perhaps. Yeah. You know, um, the, or there wasn't enough violence, there wasn't enough sex. Um, I mean, people had to think too much in the film, and, or the TV show, and had to keep track of characters. Well, they had to pay attention. Yeah. And, um, you know, and, and listen closely. Uh, but I think that made the show very re rewarding. Um, but, you know, yeah, there wasn't a lot of violence, there wasn't a lot of sex, there wasn't a lot of um, brutality. Um, so, and at the time, that's what cop shows kind of were, you know. They were sexy or dangerous. Being a cop was, you know, sexy and dangerous. And you solved the crime. And, and, uh, <coughs> yeah, you solved the crime in like two days. Yeah. Um, you know, but uh, the, the wire was more uh, was more exacting about uh, about you know just just how difficult it is to be uh, to be a law enforcement officer. You know, and uh, and the similarities between being a cop and the people that they were. And, you know, trying to bring down, you know, and the cat and mouse game that goes along with it, and the humanity on both sides. And it wasn't, you know, good guys and bad guys. It was, it was human beings trying to make the best of what, you know, the situation they chose to be in or was given them. And, and who wants that much nuance in a cop show? I mean, come yeah. on, right? No, oh, you want to see people get shot and then have sex. <laughs> uh, look, at the risk of this turning into a wire panel, which I've, uh, very capable of doing. You, 
did, I segue, join a couple of other cast members from The Wire, uh, Lawrence Gilliard Jr., Chad Coleman, on a little show, you guys may have heard of it, um, The Walking Dead. That's just my way of pandering to you and uh, keeping your attention. So, uh, The Walking Dead, you show up in season five. Yeah, season five. That, fantastic. Father Gabriel Stokes, uh, arguably another uh, haunted, shattered man, <laughs> who is both vulnerable and unpredictable. How in the world did you get involved with Walking Dead? Uh, I auditioned for Scott Gimple, who was a fan of The Wire. He and Robert Kirkman apparently really loved The Wire and uh, had, had some kind of pact that they wanted to work with as many actors from The Wire as possible. So I, I auditioned for the role of a uh, high school guidance counselor. That, those were the signs that I was given. And for Scott, it was me and Scott and someone filming it, and that was it. And I read once. And, uh, and then they offered me uh, the job, I think, the next day. And then uh, I was on set a week after that. Wow. No. I had never watched a show, so. Okay. I think I watched the, the first four seasons on Netflix. And How'd you feel after that? <laughs> I loved it. I, I was going to watch like 20 minutes of the show to get the tone of the yeah. tone. Because, yeah. as you mentioned, I'm not a big horror fan, you know, I have a, a bit of a weak stomach. Oops. And that's not the show to be on. <laughs> no. Weak stomach. So, uh, so I was only going to watch about the first 20 minutes of it and get a sense of what the tone of the show was and then just figure, you know, I'll, you know, I'll trust whatever the writers give me and try to make it as real as possible. And then I got hooked. Yeah. And I wanted, yeah. you know, I watched three seasons and then I had to wait, you know, to watch season four <laughs> the next day. And then, um, and I finished it on Sunday, and on Monday I was on the top of a rock, looking down at these guys, and I was like, this is surreal. Yeah, yeah. You know. Of course, the, the, it's filmed in Georgia, yep. Atlanta, and, I mean, I guess just the environment surrounding uh, area. Yeah, yes. yeah. Um, so, it's really interesting, because I, Father Gabriel, again, the character, did some bad stuff, and he feels like he's, I mean, understandable, but there's, there's something about the physicality the way you played him, I'm, I'm really curious, especially in those early seasons. How did you approach the physicality of playing Father Gabriel um, and your reactions to the other characters? You made some serious choices there, it's pretty clear. I did. Yes, uh, one thing I, I can share with you is that I took away the impulse to want to hit people. Interesting. What do you mean by that? I mean, don't you feel, when you're talking to people sometimes, and they're not making sense, you just want to slap them in the face? Please tell me that's not happening right now. Please. Like, just, okay, I take it back. I'll take what I get. I'll take what I get. No, absolutely. So, so you, you take that impulse away. Yeah. The impulse to correct. The impulse to, to punish. Um, and uh, and it takes takes a bit of uh, uh, takes a bit of attention out of your body. Really? Just because it seems like you have a lot of empathy for that character. I think you kind of have to em have empathy for everyone that you play because it's it's your job to be the voice of that character, whether they're beloved or hated or misunderstood or 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 not care for at all. Um, they're there, they're in the story for a reason, and if it's your job to uh, to be their voice, so you, you have to empathize with them, you have to, you, you, you know, you're entrusted with, uh, with speaking for them. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, could you pick the worst costume for filming? You mean all George black from head all, to toe? Yeah. <laughs> is, that like, is that like his hair shirt? Like he's, Punishing him. So. Uh, until I got the hat, it was just brutal. Yeah. I'm out there, I'm like, I'm bald, I'm dressed in all black, I'm sweating like a hostage. The sun <laughs> is just finding me everywhere. But, um, you know, that's part of the, the part of the self penitent nature, I guess, of being a priest. You're, yeah. You know? Yeah, it, it comes on. Those aren't designed to be comfortable. Yeah, yeah. Now, that, that physicality plays into it. You did mention, by the way, your weak stomach, <laughs> which I'm sure has grown stronger in the last uh, four seasons you've been on the show. Also, congratulations for surviving season 10. 
Thank you. Yeah, hold on. Um, <laughs> I'm spoiling the letter. Come on, folks. Hey, uh, so I am curious, so what do you have to do to prepare yourself mentally and physically? Because again, Greg Nicotero and his blood brigade do not, I mean, they don't, they don't hold back. You've got some, again, gnarly things. How do you prepare yourself for the stickiness and the heat and the smell of the special effects? I, I don't really. I allow all of that to try to wash over my face, hopefully. So, uh, you know, those are, those are Father Gabriel's responses. They were in real time. <laughs> That's cool, all right. I mean, what else can you do in that situation? You give in, right? can't fight it. This, yeah. is, this is nasty. This is going to be nasty for about 16 hours today. <laughs> so I'm just going to feel nasty. Speaking of feeling nasty, you have some great scenes this last season with Jeffrey Dean Morgan. Yes. I, what is it like to work with him? And I mean, what does he give you back as an actor? Because frankly, he's got an aura of genuine evil and reptilian intelligence. How do you oh, wow. deal with that? Wow. Um, I, I try to stay away from that. <laughs> that sounds dangerous. Yes. And it's sticky. <laughs> um, Here we go. But uh, I, I, uh, I enjoy working with Jeffrey Dean a, a great deal. He's a very playful actor. He tries lots of different things. And, um, and he's very charming and self effacing in his humor. Um, so he puts you at ease and makes you feel comfortable in trying out different ideas that you may have. Um, uh, so I enjoy, I enjoy playing with him a lot. I, I look forward to, uh, to some, doing some more stuff in season 10. Awesome. Awesome. I am curious, um, fans of the show, you're all fans of the show. Uh, some fans have not been really kind. I had read that you had actually received death threats from fans. Is that, is that true for the show? Yeah, that was early on, and those were just kids. Okay, so that was going out a little bit. No, I mean, I didn't know there were kids at the time. I was yeah. like, what? You yeah. want a kid? No, you don't know where I'm from. You got it. <laughs> Meet me on the corner of 82nd and 44 and 515, amen. I'll wear my Kung Fu outfit and I'll be there. <laughs> and it's like, you know, some 13 year old kid in his basement in Wisconsin somewhere. Like, <laughs> I mean, does that affect your performance in any way, or do you just. Are you able to... No, no, that was just kind of shocking, you know, wow, what's, what's, what's wrong with people way. Um, but it didn't affect my performance at all. Like, like I said, you have to, you know, it, it's about uh, it's about playing the character. Hopefully people understand that it's a story. Um, hopefully they realize that they're turning something on and then you know, sitting down and watching it through a device so it's not real. Wait, what? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Fanatics, man. It's a tough to compartmentalize sometimes. Yeah. Can you say it? <laughs> this um, is the part of the show where Seth calls the security guards. I just reached out for one last hug. Um, weird. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> hey, last question before we turn it over to Q&A. Hey, has anything on the show, it is a horror show, yeah. genuinely upset or unnerved you? You couldn't necessarily leave that at the office, so to speak. Anything really kind of bothered you or scared you? You mean since I've been on the show? Yeah, yeah, yeah. In the four seasons you've been there. Five seasons come out. Yeah, five, five. Uh, no, no, nothing's really, no, no. <laughs> Man of Steel, ladies and gentlemen. Man of Steel. Not at the moment. Uh, the question was, do I have any uh, aspirations on uh, transitioning to be a, a, a director or a producer? There's still so much about acting that I'm, that I'm trying to learn, you know, that I'm trying to explore. Um, I'm sorry. I don't, I don't know that I, I'm ready to, uh, to tell somebody else how to do it. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks.
We got a mic coming, sorry about that. Sorry. The, the question was, uh, what would Father Gabriel think of himself? Uh, yeah, like the like early Father Gabriel, uh, ways back, if he could see who he is now after everything he's gone. That's a good question. Uh, I, I, I don't know if he would be uh, proud of himself or disappointed. What about the romance of Rosita? I mean, and the weird domestic situation. Did he see that coming? Because things get very um, sophisticated. Let's see how that connects to his question. Well, <laughs> I don't think Father Gabriel saw it coming. Doesn't see much coming at this point, at least not from the uh, right side. Hey, come on. Low hanging fruit. <laughs> to be fair, one of you were going to ask it. Come on. Yes, sir. Yeah, so between saving worlds and killing zombies, do you have any scars that you've got from accidents? Do I have any scars? Yeah, I'm accidents on set. Yeah, have you ever been hurt on set accidentally? Um, I, I, I have been, but uh, I don't think I can speak about it. Okay. Insurance is a thing. But um, I do have a small scar. I won't tell you where. <laughs> and it doesn't hurt anymore. <laughs> but yeah, you do get nicks and, and, and bruises and bands. And, you know, Andrew Lincoln used to get get knocked up all the time, you know, with, uh, with things because he was so physical in his performance. So he was constantly hurting his hand or his thumb or his shin or something like that. Yes? What do you have? Um, I just wanted to tell you that your American Girl rendition on the cruise oh. was really good. Oh, so, thank you. Thank you. Do you, oh, guys, yeah. do you guys sing together? Songs you guys like to sing? I'm the only one who sings on the set, much to the consternation of everyone else. They don't usually do Backstreet Boys, then? No, no. We don't break out into music videos and, you know, in between takes. So that would be cool. I'm the only person who, uh, who really enjoys it, um, in, uh, in singing, you know. Um, I know that uh, Ross could probably, I really want him to do some Johnny Cash for me, you know. He's a person's got the beats, he's got the baritone, whatever. He could definitely rock Johnny Cash, but he won't, he won't sing Johnny Cash for me. That's another story. Thank you. I think while well, we had the the, uh, the upper deck of uh, on the cruise, so everyone kind of stayed up on the upper deck. But um, that wasn't as much fun to me. I wanted to explore the ship. You know, I figured that um, you know there wasn't anyone who was armed on the cruise, <laughs> so I could wander around and not have to worry about you know someone sticking me with something. Like, which is again. <laughs> Something that tends to happen to you more often than not. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, but no, that, that, that's mostly what, what happened on, on the cruise is people hung out on the, on the top deck where, um, where we had the same kind of food set up and everything else as, as the, uh, the buffet on the eighth floor. Hello. Hello. Um, so knowing your character now, where it's now with Bono Gabriel and stuff like that on The Walking Dead, if it was Rosita, spoiler alert, on that spike, mm -hmm. like as if it would follow in the comics, would you think your character would just drop that and just kind of go carelish and seek revenge? Now that that love interest is there, and in a sense it would be... A, a so what do you think? What, I, knowing what you know of Father Gabriel, what you have experienced of him, what, what do you think? I think he would definitely drop and go after Alpha and that crew. Because in that sense, you know, it's that love interest that you now have with Rosita. Mm -hmm. And in a sense now there's a double murder going on because, you know, she would lose the 
that in the child. So, yes. so I think you would go out and keep tasks. Okay. I don't know. I mean, the way you forgave Anne when the bucket head was coming down in yeah. season eight. We talked, we kind of joked about the eye, but in a lot of ways, that was his sacrifice. In a show about people that are resurrected, mm -hmm. your character bought his soul back. He seems like a forgiver to me. Okay, that's just an argument from the other side. Okay, I like them both. Hey, no, no. Do I have to answer, or is it... No, no, no. <laughs> Caught in the middle, you decide! Thank you. Um, what was the worst and best scene to film? Uh, I think my... my, my I don't know if, I've, if I have a best scene. I have like a few favorite scenes, and, and, and one of my favorite scenes is uh, from like the first episode that I was in when we were in the waterlogged food bank uh, and uh, trying to run three feet of water from from walkers. You know, uh, that was really exciting for me. That was one of my favorite uh, memories and times, and I think it was my second day on the set. Yeah, it was my second day. Seriously, well, you, you were in for it. Yeah. Do they give yeah. you wetsuits or anything? Or were yeah, you we had wetsuits underneath, and uh, I almost passed out because I was, I was overheated. Um, and nervous, was very nervous, because um, I had never acted in three feet of water before, and, and I had gotten a sense, well, this is a very big show now, that they've created this giant tank to shoot the scene. Um, and I guess the immensity of it and all that typically made me a little more revved up, so that uh, that was exciting. Um, as far as the worst, that would be the same scene. <laughs> because I almost passed out. Because I had to climb up a ladder to fall into the thing, you know, we fall through the floor and I had to fall into the water and I was under, on top of the ladder underneath a lamp, which were very hot. These were very hot, these like these, watch it these lamps <laughs> that are uh, shining on us right now. It was like being three inches from it with a wetsuit on, trying to, you know, prepare to be terrified and plunge into this thing. And I got lightheaded. And I was thinking, you know, can't fall out. You can't fall out. If you fall out, they'll fire you. If you fall out, they'll fire you. And this is what I'm saying to myself as I'm starting to lose consciousness. If you fall out, they'll fire you. <laughs> uh, rolling! Thank God! Oh, man. <laughs> like, that was great, it looked like you just fell. Yes, I did. <laughs> <laughs> they use that take, too. They would use it by outtakes for actual broadcast takes. Method by unconsciousness. That's, uh, that's, a new, yeah. that's a new one. So that was my best and, and worst, I guess. Thanks. Hello. Hello. Um, when you're on set with everyone else, who do you think you, you yourself can relate the most to? Uh, Josh McDermott. We have a similar cynicism <laughs> and sarcastic point of view on life. I think. I can relate to him. I don't know if he can relate to me because uh, he's Josh. <laughs> and you just never really know. Thank you. You guys, have some, you guys have a great scene when you're, again, trying to negotiate um, a very sophisticated adult situation. Yes. It's fantastic. I mean, does he, does he give you a lot as an actor or are you guys just giving it to each other? We're, 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 we're playing. We're, you know, we're trying to have as much fun as we can. We've got, we've got very interesting characters, I think, yeah. both of us, so I think we enjoy uh, when they get to share uh, scenes together. That's awesome. Hello. Hello. I love The Walking Dead, and I love your character. Mm -hmm. uh, my question for you, um, are there any actors or actresses that you haven't had a chance to work with that you would like to work with? Um, yes, there are. There, there are a lot. I um, I don't want to name any names because that would creep people out. It's <laughs> fine. <laughs> one hug, I said. One hug. I don't know. What <laughs> Um, so, but yes, I, I, I do, I, I do have actors I'd like to work with there, and, uh, and directors as well, you know, there are people, you, you see their work, and you go, well, I wonder if you'd like to play with that person, 
you know, they've got a really off-brand sense of humor or delivery or, you know, essence or whatever it may be. Hi. Um, I've been, oh, thank you. I'm a fan of yours, and I've been a fan of Walking Dead since day one. And my opinion, or my question is, in your personal opinion, who would be best to take on Alpha? Of who's left? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. In my personal opinion, it would be best to take on Alf. Probably Tom Cruise from uh, Minority Report. So we have the word in there. Let's tie in. Um, Michonne. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I think Michonne would be best suited to take on Alf. I agree. Interaction with her yet with Samantha Orton? She is terrifying. Um, not in season nine. Gotcha. <laughs> I didn't hear anything. You didn't. You didn't I say anything. I don't know about season ten. We haven't. We, we start filming in a couple of weeks. Again. I didn't hear anything. You didn't <laughs> say anything. <laughs> I'm just kidding. No, just don't take that, guys. No, please. That's ridiculous. Sorry, man. Go ahead. When you found out that you were going to be on The Walking Dead, did you read The Walking Dead comics? I read the comic where Father Gabriel was introduced, and I stopped there because um, I noticed that there are differences between the characters in the comics and what was going on in the TV show, and I figured I was doing the TV show, which is a very different thing. And I would just trust whatever the writers were giving me on the TV show, and not get tied to anything from the comics. That's good because the comic doesn't end well for Father Gabriel. Doesn't end well for many. No. Look, just trying to review the cast list of the show alone. Yes. Good grief! I mean, it's like I had to have flashcards to remember who everybody was. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Nasty kill list. Yes, sir. Yes, big fan. Thank you. Uh, gotta ask. So, being on the set with Josh and working for the day and half, has there been a time where he's just you so bad that you actually have to go ahead and walk off set. You know, people Oh, I wish I, I, I wish I had a story like that for you. You see, you won one so badly. Uh, alas, alas, I don't, I'm not the guy to prank on the set. Oh, okay. Not very well. <laughs> <laughs> I, I got a question. What's it like to be the only, uh, non-British actor on the show. <laughs> it's lonely, man. <laughs> you have like no frame of reference, I mean, you know. Yeah, that's cool. Anybody else have questions, please? Yeah, come on up. Can I have to walk through the mask? Oh, there we go. Look, as soon as you lose survival of the fittest, we got you. Okay, so you've worked with alien bugs, um, wolves, and zombies. Are there any creatures that you'd like to work with in the future if, if you have a chance? Um, more aliens. Different kinds of aliens. The alien bugs were cool. I like that. The bug thing was, was a lot of fun. But yes, different forms of life from outer space. I'm, I'm, I'm a sci-fi fan. Did you read Heinlein growing up? I did not. Uh, it wasn't required reading for me. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't care. So, um, but I did read the book uh, before, before I did the movie. Cool, cool. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Those special effects, by the way, completely hold up. Well, I am kind of curious what it was like interacting with the mechanical bugs. It was great, man. They, they was so great. three or four people working on each bug, you know, so that they, you know, they could move laterally and forward and backwards. It was, it was pretty cool. Yes, sir. We got switched out. To, there was one Mario who would have got discouraged because <laughs> he's taller, so you're like a... Just a big mug of disappointment there. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, if Father Gabriel ever bites the dust, mm -hmm. how would you like to see him go? Oh, jeez. <laughs> I mean, I've had a different, you know... Uh, I've, got, I've heard that's been asked that question before, and I've had different answers for it. One was in his sleep at the age of 94. Good. That would be nice. With residuals. You know, another would be like in the, the way it is in the comics, because that would be, you know, horrific. Um, but I, I think um, 
you know, however Father Gabriel goes uh, is, is, is how it goes. I mean, he's had his, I think he's redeemed himself to this point, so it wouldn't necessarily have to be a heroic death. You know what I mean? I think he's already kind of covered in an act of heroism ground. Um, I would just hope that it would have some meaning. Sorry, I can't answer your question better than that. A meaningful death? Yeah. A meaningful death, yes. That's all anybody wants. Sheet. Let's take one last question and we'll uh, wrap things up here. I actually don't have a question. Oh, I just was going to tell you thank you. We watched you on Team Wolf and everything. Oh. I think you were actually the best actor on that show. Thank you, man. I just wanted to say thank you and keep up the good work. Thank you. Thank you, man. Yeah. Uh, the code, yeah, I was in the pilot for that, but um, uh, I haven't worked on that any, any, anymore. Um, I don't think I can talk about the other project that I did, but it's going to be uh, this summer. Very cool. Hey, uh, sorry. No, seriously, this has been an absolute pleasure for me, and I'm glad I kind of creeped him out a little bit because that's my job as a fan. But uh, you've been such a good sport, man. Seriously, thank you so much.